Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basak. And I'm Tim Stenevec. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And Bitcoin and other tokens are on the decline to start the second quarter, and that's after a historic run bought on by ETF demands. And Sam Bankman frieds 25-year sentence is potentially just the beginning for others on trial, including other executives like Caroline Ellison and Gary Wong. And we're weeks away from the all-important Bitcoin halving, which will heavily impact miners and the entire process of creating the world's largest digital asset. And we're going to discuss with one of those miners, the CEO of HUD8. All that and more ahead. First, though, as Shanali mentioned, market's seeing a lot of red today. Risk assets sinking. Bitcoin and crypto-related stocks, well, they're no exception. Bitcoin earlier in the session fell as much as 7.4%. That was the biggest intraday decline going all the way back to March 19th, now down just over 7%. The crypto rally that we've seen so far this year losing a little steam in recent days. This is traders rethink Fed interest rate cuts for the remainder of 2024. Ether down uh, now 7.5% off uh, about 20% off of last month's highs. Now, the so-called meme coins, perhaps unsurprisingly, also slumping today. Read here, the uh, MV Digital Assets 100 SML IDX. It's an index that follows uh, the 50 smallest digital assets in uh, an index that covers this. Uh, think dog with hat and the like. Um, that's down more than 6% as we speak. And then those crypto-related stocks also taking a hit today. Uh, Coinbase shares down right now by 3.8%. It was down as much as 6.4 a little earlier in the session, uh, but off those lows. Shanali. I also want to talk about another thing closely tied here to the price of Bitcoin, and that is the flows of those ETFs. Remember, the steep rally that we have seen drew the most of those inflows, but now we're actually seeing a moment here that on Monday, there were actually 90 million nearly worth of net outflows experienced by that batch of 10 ETFs that were launched earlier this year at January 11th. And since that moment of January 11th, we have seen about $12 billion worth of flows, a money, a new money attracted to the product here. But remember, even though 90 million of net outflows, Tim, sounds small, it does show you a different direction of travel. Yeah, I'll certainly be interested to see what flows end up looking like after today's session if these lows continue to hold. Meanwhile, the big news in the past week, of course, was the 25-year prison sentence for Sam Bankman-Fried for stealing billions of dollars from FTX customers. Here's how some legal and regulatory experts reacted right here on Bloomberg Crypto. There were no new laws needed here. I mean, Sam was convicted on laws that had been on the books for a very, very, very long time. And he committed one of the oldest crimes in the book, namely fraud. Uh, and then, of course, adding on the perjury, the witness tampering, you know, everything else that, that came along with that. Uh, and so there, there wasn't really um, much that could be done from the standpoint of new regulation that would have prevented this specific and particular behavior. So in the federal system, there is no longer parole. There hasn't been for a long time. And that means that the maximum benefit a defendant can get is 15% off for good time. So if you essentially have good behavior in prison, you'll have a 15% reduction in your sentence. But that's it. What matters in sending a message with a sentence is that this was an $8 billion fraud. This wasn't uh, a mistake that happened to work out in the end and people are going to get a lot of their money back. Um, he was sending a message sort of to Wall Street, to crypto, to everyone, that if you steal money, you will get a, sti a stiff sentence. Um, and this is obviously a very stiff sentence for a white-collar defendant. Well, now, after helping seal the conviction uh, for their former boss, Bankman Freed's other conspirators, Caroline Ellison, Gary Wong, and Nishad Singh, await their own fate. Bloomberg's Ava Benny Morrison reported on this, and she joins us now. Ava, if you were to pick one of these three individuals to receive sort of the, the harshest sentence, uh, moving forward. Which one would it be? It's a sort of a double-edged sword here. Caroline Ellison gave the most damning testimony against Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, and arguably she was uh, one of the cooperators that was the most involved in some of the wrongdoing. So she could see the largest sentence, even though her testimony was probably the most valuable. Then you've got someone like Nishad Singh, who was the chief of engineering there and learned that uh, FTX was borrowing, sorry, Alameda was borrowing FTX customer funds. But then Gary Wong, who was uh, involved in some of the wrongdoing um, pretty early on. Now, what does it mean for Caroline Ellison in particular? Because you had mentioned she was very closely involved at in what was happening here. She was the CEO of Alameda at one point. But she did give a very thorough testimony. How much would her sentence be reduced in light of what she has done for prosecutors here? 
from the federal conversations that I've had with former federal prosecutors and legal experts, they say that cooperating witnesses in white collar cases rarely get prison time. But there are exceptions, especially in big high profile cases that involve multi billion dollar losses. So she could see anywhere from 12 months prison to no prison time at all. Okay. Um, Ava, you reported also on what these folks have been up to for the last roughly 18 months or so. What can you tell us about what they've been doing apart from co cooperating with prosecutors? It was one of the big questions we had. Um, these, these three witnesses had managed to keep such a low profile um, despite how high profile this case was. We've since learned that um, they've managed to land on their feet. Nishad Singh, for example, is working as a software engineer in Silicon Valley. Gary Wong managed to get some sort of employment, you know, only months after he pleaded guilty to fraud. He's also working in the tech industry. Uh, we're not exactly sure what Caroline Ellison is doing, but we know that she's moved back to the US and she was some, spending some time in Boston and where she grew up. Bloomberg's Ava Benny Morrison, we thank you for your time and your reporting. She's been all over this case since the very beginning. Now, sticking with FTX, Better Market CEO Dennis Kelleher had this to say about the sentencing of SPF. It sends an entire message to the entire industry, especially the crypto kingpins, that the law applies to them as it must and that even crypto cro crooks will do the hard time for their crimes. And he added that the Justice Department must now prosecute and severely punish SPF's immediate co-conspirators, even those who pled guilty guilty and testified against him. Dennis Kelleher joins us now. Dennis, maybe let's expand here for a moment on how you feel about the co-conspirators in what had happened with FTX, even though that many of them had come forward early on, testified to a significant degree. Why should they face greater penalties in your view? Well, I'm, I'm not saying they should face greater penalties. I'm saying that they should be severely punished. But they should also be seriously rewarded for their cooperation. They materially helped the prosecution, they testified truthfully, and they facilitated the conviction and sentencing of who was the core kingpin here, Sam Bankman Fried. So I'm not in any way suggesting they shouldn't get leniency for what they've done. They definitely should, but they should also see a period of time behind jail bars. White collar criminals have to to understand that they can't get a pass. We can't only be throwing crooks, white collar, I mean, blue collar street criminals in prison. The message has to be sent mm. to white collar criminals, not just to kingpins, but their enablers, that they need to go to jail for at least some period of time, as well as, by the way, they should be barred from the financial industry for life. Hmm. So, Dennis, um, are we talking, in your view, months or years here? What, in your opinion, would be fair for these co-conspirators? Well, it's hard to know from the outside because you don't have the probation reports. You really don't know what the prosecution knows in terms of how helpful they were relative to others. Um, but I would hope that they would all see at least 12 months inside a prison cell. Um, and that would be, of course, you know, a 90 percent reduction or some significant reduction from what they would otherwise get if they did not cooperate. So I think some, there's a balance, but you need more information than the public has is available to the public. When you think but also, let's remember, it's not just their co-conspirators. Um, there were dozens, if not hundreds of others, who helped Sam Bankman-Fried and his co-conspirators um, do this crime and these many crimes over a long period of time. And the Southern District of New York should not just take the scalp of the kingpin and take care of the cooperating witnesses and then move on. There are a lot of other people involved here. And the Southern District of New York should also revisit its inexplicable decision to drop the campaign finance violations, the biggest campaign finance scandal since Watergate, and actually maybe worse, and they're dropping that investigation in charges. It makes sense not to prosecute Sam Bankman-Fried at this point, but there were dozens and dozens, dozens of others who wantonly, criminally broke the campaign finance laws in this country to corrupt our election process and hijack mm, the public's Dennis. agenda here. Dennis, let's speak more about the campaign finance violations because those uh, charges were dropped here. Do you think that it has actually led to more of an influx of money from the crypto community into the, the federal system here? How do you really parse what is appropriate at this point when it comes to crypto money into politics versus what happened in the sake of Sam Bankman-Fried's case? Well, the allegations and the reporting on Sam Bankman-Fried is massive criminal violations using straw donors, funneling money uh, illegally into different places to influence elections. 
Um, and that is very different than what we're seeing when people normally use the campaign finance system, although, uh, frankly, it is legalized corruption in many respects. That doesn't just apply to crypto. That applies to all the dark money that's now allowed and unleashed by the Supreme Court decisions. But so there's two there's two parts there. One is the criminal activities, and that should be investigated, prosecuted just ruthlessly by the Southern District of New York. Separately, we have a campaign finance system that allows the crypto industry and other industries to exercise inordinate influence on our campaigns. And crypto is spending their predatory profits uh, to buy as many politicians as possible to get their special interest legislation passed that will result in them getting the appearance of regulation without the reality of regulation. And that threatens customers, investors, and financial stability. Hey, Dennis, hey, in Dennis. the past, you've referred to crypto as a lawless industry. And I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. in your opinion, is there any good use for crypto out there right now? Well, you don't have to have my opinion. I mean, it's objectively true. They've had 14 years to come up with a legitimate, um, socially useful use for crypto, and they have not. Crypto is only useful for wild speculation, gambling, and it's the preferred financial product of criminals worldwide, from money laundering, tax evasion, ransomware, uh, narco-terrorism, sex trafficking. I mean, we see it every day. This is not my opinion. These are the objective facts. There is no legitimate use case for crypto, period, full stop. It's like all these investors are being sucked into this financial product uh, having my view, many of them having no idea. You can't do a discounted cash flow. You can't look at revenue. You look at all their other investments, and this particular financial product has nothing similar to them. And mm. that is a big red flag that's going to come home soon Dennis. at some point when Dennis. crypto crashes again. Dennis, when you think about just how much attention is being paid to crypto, when you think about uh, what is happening um, among congressmen in Washington, when you think about what's happening at the Justice Department, record-breaking fines we've seen here, do you think that some attention has been taken away from the traditional financial industry to focus more on crypto here? And do you think that attention makes sense? Well, you're right, Sonalia, that there has been a, a diversion of resources, time, and attention to crypto because of the widespread high-profile lawbreaking going on. Regulators and prosecutors necessarily have to do that when you have an industry breaking the law as broadly and frequently as crypto is. Um, but you're also right that that's a diversion of resources from all sorts of other regulation and prosecution where there's illegal behavior uh, and criminal behavior. There's, there's finite resources, there's finite time and attention. Uh, the prosecutors and regulators have limited budgets. Uh, crypto seems to have almost a limitless budget. And the problem there, of course, is predatory conduct generates enormous profits. Mm -hmm. But the industry, to go back, is, is a lawless industry. It is taking the position, and it's the only industry that I can think of ever that has taken the position that no laws apply to them. The security laws don't apply. The commodity laws don't apply. And they're basically saying to prosecutors and regulators, catch me if you can. And that's, that is just rank lawbreaking. Dennis, I know there are certainly many folks we've had on our air who would disagree with you. We've got to get you back on and uh, chat with some of those folks. Yeah. Uh, the industry certainly <laughs> not a monolith, but we appreciate your comments. Dennis Kelleher, the president and CEO of Better Markets, joining us here on Bloomberg Crypto. And coming up next, we're going to talk about that Bitcoin halving because it's expected in the coming weeks. We'll be talking to CEOs and a number of data miners about the impact on their business. And up, eight, up next is Hot 8 CEO Asher Ganute. Plus, Binance announces its first ever board of directors after that anti-money laundering and sanctions violation settlement just last year. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg.
We are less than three weeks away from that long-awaited Bitcoin halving. Remember, this happens every 210,000 new blocks. New Bitcoin supply is slashed, with the number of rewards cut in half for miners. And while it happens roughly every four years, the price per Bitcoin has ballooned meaningfully since the first halving back in 2012. Since then, that was back at 2012, I mean, that was less than $15 a piece. And now the rewards are scheduled to drop to 3.125 Bitcoin per block. But remember, Bitcoin now is trading at over 60,000 a piece. So each one is more valuable, even though there will be less supply. There's another big difference this time around, and that is how much more demand there is in the market, given the new spot Bitcoin ETFs that have come. And remember, that new supply and new demand will come together at a time that we've never seen before. Well, for more on this, let's bring in Asher Janut, CEO of Hut8. It's a Canadian-based Bitcoin miner. He's the first of many crypto mining executives that we're going to have on the show in the coming weeks as we lead up to the halving that's expected in about three weeks. Good to have you on with us, Asher. I I'm wondering how you're looking at the halving and what's priced in right now as we do expect this in the coming weeks. How are you thinking about this halving differently than previous halvings? It's at a different scale. And so larger scale operators now have to really think about how to be the lowest cost operator within the industry. So actually now HUD-8 is U.S. domiciled and based out of Miami. So a part of our uh, a merger that just happened was I started a company and co-founded it called U.S. Bitcoin Corp. We merged with HUD-8 Mining Corp. And we formed HUD-8 Corp. based in the U.S., uh, based in Miami and redomiciled the company. And so for us, a big part of it was bringing on a strong balance sheet. We have over 9,100 Bitcoin, around $600 million of Bitcoin on the balance sheet, really rigid operations. And really, my belief is to be a successful large-scale miner in this ecosystem, you just have to be a low-cost operator. And as long as you're a low-cost operator, when the markets run, you're able to reap the rewards and be highly profitable. Mm -hmm. And the markets compress, like post-halving, you're able to manage through the halving and consolidate. Yeah, and, and it's worth talking about just that impact on the industry at large. Asher, the last time we've seen really uh, a downturn in Bitcoin prices, we did see a washout. We saw some miners even hit bankruptcy. And now you're having a moment where the rewards are also going to be lesser, although Bitcoin is worth more. But you also see that derivative effect, how much a price of a miner's shares can drop when you see Bitcoin dropping in price as well. Do you expect a washout? in the industry? Will some not make it? Yeah, so I think the dynamics that exist today are different than what happened in 2022. And so today, for example, price is, I think, bailing a lot of folks out, where if price remained at $30,000, $40,000 with the halving, you'll see a lot more M&A and distress opportunities out there. Back in 2022, a big area that led to a lot of bankruptcies in the mining sector and distressed assets was because of the leverage of 2021. A lot of companies grew with debt, and that debt couldn't be serviced in 2022 when Bitcoin prices went down and energy prices went up. Where we are today is I think a lot of the growth that we've seen in 23 and even early 24 has been through the equity markets and a lot of folks raising capital through their ATMs and, uh, and diluting. And so even though you won't see as many uh, bankruptcies due to kind of the under leverage in terms of that ecosystem, I think you'll see M&A activity just due to an inability to get capital. Smaller scale operators won't be able to raise the capital they'll need in order to grow their businesses and to grow their operations, where I think co capital will concentrate at the large scale operators who have the lowest marginal cost of production. Hey, Asher, um, where is the, the cheapest place for you to mine Bitcoin right now? And, and how much does it cost per Bitcoin? Yeah, so our uh, overall in our fleet, we announced that our average cost of mining Bitcoin, excluding hosted facilities, was around $16,000. And our average cost, uh, including hosted facilities, was around $18,000. Our cheapest uh, sites are really the sites that have stranded power, where there's depressed nodes. And uh, most of the time, that overlaps with the rollout of renewable development. So we have sites behind the meter at wind farms, for example, where those wind farms were built. There's a lot of wind that blows when uh, when it's producing power and it's creating congestion at that node. And so at times, that's cheap power or even negative power based on those environments. And so by creating and building a Bitcoin load at that area, we're able to consume power that's really cheap, but also help those wind and solar generators by increasing the pricing there because we're bringing demand to the point of generation where historically there hasn't been enough transmission to transfer that power out. And that's what's leading to kind of depressed and stranded energy and lower pricing. 
Asher, how much impetus is there when you look at the mining community to see how much power they're using and uh, what the equipment costs look like to start diversifying away from just Bitcoin mining into other areas? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point that I think a lot of folks really don't think about in this is in order to grow, we're a pretty capex heavy business, right? We have to build infrastructure, i.e. data centers for Bitcoin mining. We also have to buy machines, which make up a majority of the capex up front. And so I think when a lot of folks look at the businesses, how large of these companies have grown, and they haven't really thought about how much money did it cost for those companies to grow in that fashion. When we think about HUD-8, really the underlying kind of platform layer that connects everything is underlying energy infrastructure. Our directional thesis in the next decade is we believe that the consumption and the demand on energy will appraise the net new added generation into the ecosystem. And so we would like to be at the intersection of energy infrastructure and new age technologies. And so new age technologies include Bitcoin mining, that's flexible load. That's interesting for a lot of assets where you have stranded power and congested nodes. In addition, we have five traditional data centers that we own in Canada right now. We announced our first pod of H100s from right. NVIDIA up for AIs. And so continuing to expand use cases outside of just Bitcoin mining that are new technologies and energy intensive. Hey, Asher, got to ask about the stock today. It's down about 15%. Yeah. It's having its worst day going back yeah. to January, down about 30% so far this year. Um, what, yeah. in your opinion, if anything, is the, is the market getting wrong right now this year? Yeah, so I think in general, a lot of mining stocks move with Bitcoin pricing. And so Bitcoin pricing as well as ha having updates. I think for us, we have a pretty complex story. We did a merger between a public Canadian company and a U.S. private company. It merged together as a U.S. public company. We had uh, reports that came out. We had a change in leadership that the board decided it was time for a change. And so the last three months have been more volatile. But last Thursday, we had our first earnings call. We showed our kind of financial numbers. We showed a lot of metrics and that built confidence amongst the markets. And so for us, it's continuing to execute. We have a large balance sheet on Bitcoin um, that we hold. We have large scale operations. We're the largest operator of Bitcoin mining facilities in North America today and continuing to have a diver diversified revenue stream where we have, mm -hmm. uh, where we have in Bitcoin mining, self mining, hosting and uh, co-location. And then we have our AI and HPC right. business as well. HUD 8 Mining CEO Asher Janut, we have to leave it there. Thank you for your time ahead of a very long-awaited moment for Bitcoin. Now, coming up next, Binance is lining up its first board of directors. We're going to talk all about it next. This is Bloomberg. Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, named a board of directors for the first time, this after pleading guilty last year to U.S. charges of anti-money laundering and sanctions violations. And it was certainly an interesting moment, as we know that Binance faced uh, an investigation earlier from the U.S. Justice Department, and of course is now making changes after a change in CEO. That's all for Bloomberg Crypto for now, but join us again next week, same time, same place. This is Bloomberg.